Joining us now is Paul Davies, and how's this for a title? Theoretical physicist, cosmologist, astrobiologist, and the author of The Eerie Silence, Renewing Our Search for Alien Intelligence. I welcome you and all of your titles to that chair in this studio. Thank you. Nice to have you here. Uh, this is the 50th anniversary of Frank Drake's Search for Intelligent Life Beyond Planet Earth. So let's start there. Tell us who Frank Drake is and or was and what he tried to do. Well, 50 years ago, uh, this then little-known American radio astronomer decided to start sweeping the skies with a radio telescope in the hope of stumbling across a radio message from ET. And uh, after 50 years of hiss and crackle, he's got nothing much to show for it other than the eerie silence. How I should pl point out it's not just Frank Drake now, it's a big industry. Sure. How did, he, I mean, how did he get started? What made him think that he could pull all this together and how did he get his equipment and all that stuff? Well, it all goes back to the Second World War where a lot of people working on radar were astronomers and physicists, of course, and they realized that some of their equipment, which they could get cheap at the end of the war, could be used to make huge dishes and listen for radio waves coming from the sky. And so radio astronomy was born in the late 1940s. And it took a while for them to realize that these huge dishes they were able to build quite cheaply had the power to communicate not just across terrestrial distances, but interstellar distances. Mm. Then in 1959, in a famous paper in Nature, a couple of physicists pointed out that if there were any aliens out there, they might be trying to communicate with us using radio, and that whilst the chances of searching for such radio signals were uh, very low, uh, that if nobody tried it, then the probability of success would be strictly zero. So it was time to try. Yeah. And, and where was he located? Up the challenge. At that stage, he was using the Green Bank Radio Telescope in Western Australia. In I'm sorry, in West Virginia. West Virginia. Right. And is it, any of that still there? Well, the original equipment, unfortunately, is gone, but the radio telescope is still there. It's still a radio observatory. Gotcha. Now, he came up with an equation, Drake's famous equation. Right. Do you want to take a shot at explaining that to a non-scientific audience? Well, it's dead easy because it's not a real equation in the usual sort of physics sense of the term. It's just a collection of factors that go to make up the total number of communicating civilizations that we might guess are out there in the galaxy. Now, I should say right at the outset that we haven't a clue how many are out there, mm -hmm. if any. At this uh, particular state of our ignorance, we have no hard evidence, one way or the other, for any life beyond Earth, let alone intelligent life. So this is just a series of guesses. But the factors in Drake's equation are the things you would need to know if you're to be able to estimate how many civilizations might be out there. For, for example, example, the amount of real estate, how many Earth-like planets are out there. Well, we now know that quite well. We can guess uh, probably upwards of a, a billion uh, within our galaxy. So there's plenty of places that aliens might be. Uh, but then we go to the factor that we absolutely don't know, which is what are the chances that life will start up on an Earth-like planet if you've got one? Now, obviously it happened on Earth, but does that mean it would happen on another Earth? We haven't a clue, because we don't know how life began. This is the big problem. We have a great theory of how life evolves. It's called Darwin's theory of evolution. <laughs> uh, we have a mechanism. We understand how life evolves. Nobody understands how it got started in the first place. It might be something that happens readily, under Earth-like conditions, or it might be something that is a bizarre fluke and has happened only once. And we simply don't know. So at that point, really further speculation is useless. So trying to work out how many communicating civilizations are out there is a waste of time if we don't know how many planets actually have life on them. But you say there are a billion Earth-type planets, and I'm just right, curious. Right, right. On Star Trek, they used to call those Class M planets. What do you guys call them? Oh, Earth-like. <laughs> Earth-like, okay. Or sometimes super-Earths, if they are super like Earth, but bigger. Gotcha. Drake's work led to SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And can you sort of fill us in on what SETI has been doing over the intervening 50 years to find intelligent life out there somewhere? Well, it's almost entirely restricted to radio searches. There's a little bit of search for flashing lights, uh, that's, uh, that's optical SETI, uh, but mostly it's radio. Now, in the early days, they were very worried about what frequency would ET use. Uh, wouldn't it be terrible to point your radio telescope at the right star but miss the message because you tuned into the wrong station? Hmm. Uh, but uh, now they're able to monitor about a billion radio channels simultaneously right across the, the board. Uh, and so that problem has gone away. Uh, but there's still the problem of the target stars. So they have a list of a uh, few thousand that are likely looking stars in our neighborhood of the galaxy. And they point the telescope at them one by one and uh, work their way around. and. And, and hope that they'll one day pick up a signal. But and they so pick far, up nothing? Not a well, thing? Well, there are plenty of false alarms. 
Uh, and one of the things that you, you have to do in this game is to make sure that if you get what sounds like an artificial signal, you eliminate things like uh, mobile phone in the kitchen and uh, mm. uh, ra radar from a nearby installation, all the satellites, all those sorts of things have to be eliminated. They've got very good at doing that now. What could you hear, though, that might lead a scientist to think just for a few seconds this might be something and then realize it isn't? Oh, well, there was a very famous uh, false alarm uh, way back in the 1960s. Uh, this was a discovery made by uh, Jocelyn Bell, as her name was at the time, in uh, Cambridge in the UK. Uh, she had a rudimentary radio telescope, and she picked up some uh, regular pulsations and didn't quite know what these were. And for a while, they were codenamed LGM, for Little Green Men, uh, <laughs> just in case uh, this might be ET trying to call. And they sat on the data for about six months whilst they checked out that hypothesis, then realized that these were, as we now know, spinning neutron stars, so they're natural sources, pulses. But what you're looking for is anything fishy, anything that's like an anomaly, anything that doesn't look like it's got a natural explanation. Uh, and so the particular things that the, the SETI folk look for are really rather restricted. And one of my criticisms about this entire enterprise is I think they ought to cast the net more widely and look for other types of, of radio traffic and, and other things entirely, not, uh, not just radio. Do you think extraterrestrial life is out there? Well, I'm a scientist, and so therefore we have to work on evidence. And I think the correct attitude for scientists to take is uh, one of open-minded skepticism, so that you remain skeptical about a claim until you see some evidence. You can be open-minded. I'm prepared to believe that there is plenty of life out there and plenty of intelligent life. But so far, we have no evidence for it. And so my correct position, I think, is to be skeptical until I'm shown that evidence. Okay, in, taking that skeptical but open position forward, is it... Uh, is it within the realm of possibility that we could be the only intelligent life, not only in this galaxy, but in galaxies around us? Oh, absolutely. That we could be possible. the only life. The only life. Because the big step is going from non-life to life. We don't know if that's a freak event, something so bizarre that the probability is such that it would happen only once in the universe, uh, or whether it's something that more or less automatically occurs. We have no idea. <laughs> which on that spectrum it is. So the best, perhaps the best explanation for why we haven't heard anything, despite those billions of radio signals we're sending out and, and so-called stations we're listening to, the best explanation might be because we're it. Because we're alone. That's right. We're alone in the universe. Wouldn't that's that that's the obvious. That's the hell out of you if that were the truth? Well, some people find that uplifting because they think it makes us very special, but it depresses me. Uh, by, by nature, I would like to think that we live in a universe that's teeming with intelligent life and that we're the new kids on the block and we will make contact one day uh, with a sort of network of communicating civilizations and that cosmic wisdom will descend. <laughs> okay, if that's not the explanation, if we're not it, why do you suppose we haven't heard anything in response yet? Well, if you talk to Frank Drake, and I, I should say uh, at this point that Frank is still in the game 50 years on. He's hmm. now in his late 70s, uh, but he's still an active SETI astronomer and he's still upbeat, and that says something about the extraordinary tenacity of the man, mm -hmm. that, that he can uh, feel it's worth pursuing, even after 50 years of null results. Um, but uh, uh, if you ask them, what they say is, well, you know, we've only had 50 years, give, give us uh, a bit longer and give us some more money to build more sensitive equipment, and we'll search a bigger volume of the galaxy. Um, but my feeling is, after 50 years, it's a good time to take stock and to say, well, maybe we should broaden the search, maybe. Uh, we're looking for the wrong thing in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, there are other things we could be looking for. What should we be doing? Well, I think we should look for any signature of intelligence. Uh, every, when we talk intelligence, we're really talking technology, of course. Uh, every technology leaves some footprint on its environment. So, for example, aliens looking at the Earth from a great distance could see the effects of global warming, and they could figure that there is technology at work on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just one small thing. Now, you might imagine a civilization that's been around for, say, 10 or 100 million years would have a much bigger imprint on its environment, extending beyond its home planet, maybe into its astronomical environment. Mm -hmm. uh, but the clues may be very subtle, and I like to draw the analogy with the scene of a crime. So it's a dead body. Uh, we want to know, did this person die of natural causes, or is there some skullduggery behind it? And uh, the, uh, as any forensic scientist will tell you, the clues may be very subtle, and you may need the whole panoply of science to tease out those clues. Well, in the same way, when we look out into the universe, there may be subtle clues already buried in the data. We're just not recognizing it for what it is. We're not looking for clues of 
alien technology at okay. work, but, but they could be there. But taking Frank Drake's point for a second here, the Earth is 3.8 billion years old, something like that? 4.5. 4.5 billion. I was off by a few billion. In, in the course of four and a half billion years, I mean, he is kind of right, isn't he, when he says 50 years is not all that much time if you're looking for something? Right. Um, so maybe it, we should give it, it a little more than 50 years? I, I think the main reason, if you want my explanation for why there's an eerie silence, it's that E.T. doesn't know we're here. Because, Frank, if you ask him, well, what do you think is the number of civilizations in the galaxy? He says about 10,000. So if you work out where does that put the nearest one, it's about 1,000 light years away. Uh, now, if you're living 1,000 light years from Earth, you see Earth as it was 1,000 years ago. There were no radio telescopes here 1,000 years ago. There's mm -hmm. no particular reason that the aliens would be broadcasting at us at this time. If they had good instruments, they would know there's intelligent life here because they would see the pyramids and the Great Wall of China and so on, and they might figure any millennium soon, these guys are going to have radio telescopes, it would be worth trying to communicate. But they're not going to do that until they get our first radio signals sent out into space, and that won't be for a while yet. I guess there's the other analogy too, though, which is the, the kind of ant in the highway thing, right? You know what I mean? Like the ant... No, explain. The, okay. <laughs> the ants are too primitive to understand right. that they are right beside a superhighway right. that we're on. And we don't bother to stop and look at the ants because, frankly, they're ants and we don't care about that. So we're not communicating with them. They're not communicating with us. But we're actually, you know, we're, we're within the same realm. It's just we're not communicating for pretty obvious reasons. I mean, right. that's a possibility, right. isn't it? Well, I think we have to, in this whole subject, get away from the notion of communication, that we're going to be in some sort of two-way dialogue with some uh, fantastically advanced civilization. And instead, just say, can we answer the question, are we alone in the universe, by detecting signs of alien activity through their technology? It may not be an attempt to communicate, but surely, if they're doing stuff, we should notice. Now, of course, this is extrapolating our own experience here on Earth, because as time goes on, we do bigger and bigger things, we make a bigger and bigger impact. What we don't know is after, say, 10 million years, whether a civilization maybe draws in on itself, maybe it retreats into cyberspace, maybe it doesn't have much of an imprint on its surrounding environment. So maybe very subtle clues only that there's something going on out there. But going, going with that sort of humans versus ants, they're on the super, beside the superhighway, we're driving by whizzing and neither one is sort of aware of the other. Do you think one side or the other being too primitive is part of the equation, why there's been no contact so far? Well, the SETI people have always argued that if ET is making a deliberate attempt to contact us, they will surely tailor the means of doing that to our level of technology. They'd be smart enough to know that we're not going to have super duper neutrino detectors or something, that, that we're just going to have radio and optical, and that they would use that means. So it's a little bit like, imagine 100 years ago, going off into the jungles of Brazil uh, and attempting to communicate with people there who'd never had contact with the outside world using radio. I mean, it wouldn't make any sense. Smoke signals would work better. So we have to assume that the aliens are doing the heavy lifting, that they're the smart ones, they know more about us than we know about them. Uh, and if they really want to communicate, they would make it easy for us to detect. Hmm. I, I know much of this is privately funded, but a lot of it is also you know, funded by the public purse. And there are a million different demands on the public purse. And some people will ask the question, you know, we've been at this for 50 years. We have nothing to show for it. There's no reasonable expectation that we're going to have anything to show for it if we keep at it for another 50 years. Uh, why bother doing this at all? Right. Well, I don't think the money really is a factor. It's pretty much all privately funded these days. In the past, there's been some, some government money, but it's now a private venture. Um, and we're not talking about uh, very substantial sums, a few uh, tens of millions over a number of years. Uh, it wouldn't even buy you a small failed bank. Uh, so, I mean, frankly, the money is, uh, is a tiny uh, part of this. Because don't forget, these people are developing technology and they're using... Uh, radio telescopes that may stumble across some other discovery, nothing to do with extraterrestrial life or intelligence uh, on the way. So it's good science. Hmm. So it's worth doing because it's good science. But I think that this is, comes into the same category as the great medieval cathedrals in Europe. What was the point of them? I mean, it costs huge amounts of money in relative terms, vastly more than SETI does. People built these huge structures, took generations to make, no practical value whatsoever. Uh, and yet, who would say they should be demolished because they're useless? I mean, they're mm -hmm. uh, testimony to the, to the greatness of the human spirit and our interest in things that lie beyond the daily round. Everybody wants to answer questions like, are we alone in the universe? Is there a meaning to my life? How do I fit into the great cosmic scheme of things? If globally we can't afford a few million per year 
to address some of those issues, then we're in a very poor society indeed, I think. Stephen Hawking, a good scientist in your books? Uh, I've known Stephen Hawking since 1970, and uh, he is, of course, uh, uh, one of the best uh, mathematical physicists in the world. Let's uh, hear from him, because he recently indicated that continuing the search for intelligent civilizations, in his view, could be a mistake. Here's some of what he had to say. Roll tape, please. So if aliens ever visit us, I think the outcome would be much as when Christopher Columbus first landed in America. Which didn't turn out very well for the Native Americans. I imagine they might exist in massive ships like these, having used up all the resources from the home planet below. Such advanced aliens would perhaps become nomads, looking to conquer and colonize whatever planets they can reach. He takes a very much, uh, you know, H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds view of a potential contact between us and them. One might say a Hollywood view, yes. A Hollywood, okay. <laughs> well, what do, you, what do you think of what he's putting forward? Uh, well, I'm not in the least bit uh, worried about that scenario for the simple reason. Uh, we have to ask, why would the aliens uh, come here? What would they want of Earth? Um, I, I can't imagine they want anything of human beings, but they might want the planet. Well, the planet's been here for four and a half billion years. There's no particular reason they should come now just because we're here. Uh, just because uh, we're listening for radio signals. In other words, uh, they have the means to know that this is a well-resourced planet, and it's been around for a long time, so and wanted, they haven't come. If they'd wanted what we have, they'd have been here by now, is your Absolutely. view? Absolutely. It's uh, some, sometimes called the Fermi paradox. Uh, it was pointed out by Enrico Fermi 60 years ago. Having said that, if we ever did make contact, I think I read somewhere where you said the consequences on us would have a greater impact than Copernicus, Darwin, and Einstein's discoveries all put together. Right. Now, uh, so I chair something, uh, would you believe, called the SETI Post-Detection Task Group. And it's <laughs> our job to deliberate on what happens if ET calls. And I often like to quip, if ET calls on my watch, I should be among the first to know. And the fate of the entire galaxy may rest in my hand. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, they, the whole point here is that we need to uh, address the societal impact of the discovery that we're not alone in the universe. And I like to... Uh, differentiate between two scenarios. Um, the first scenario is the message from the aliens. Uh, Hello, Earthlings, have I got news for you? Under those circumstances, I think all bets are off. Nothing would be the same again. But I have to say that's exceedingly unlikely. Much more likely is what I was discussing earlier, that we will get some incontrovertible evidence that we're not alone, that we'll be able to say, well, over there in that star system, we can see a process or a system or something that looks sufficiently weird that we can be pretty sure it has no natural explanation, that this is the product of alien technology. That's all. In which case, I think it can be announced in much the same way as any other major discovery, and it'll be a little bit like Copernicus announcing that the Earth goes around the sun. Didn't cause riots, didn't change the price of beer, but over the centuries, it's enormously influenced the way we see ourselves and our place in the universe. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Darwin's theory of evolution. Again, no riots, no disturbances, no stock market crashes or anything of that sort, but it has profoundly changed how we see ourselves. In the same way, an announcement that we're not alone in the universe isn't going to affect daily life, but over decades and centuries, it's going to be really, really important that we know that. Paul, for your sake, I hope it happens on your watch. I hope so too. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Davies, author of The Eerie Silence, Renewing Our Search for Alien Intelligence. Good of you to visit us at TVO tonight. Thanks so pleasure. much. Thank you.